In wastewater treatment, operators often say something is alkaline when what they really mean to say is that it is basic. You keep using the word. I don't think it means what you think it means. <laughs> and that's just the problem. Alkaline and basic are not the same thing. And if we mix those two terms up, we might end up ordering the wrong chemical or making the wrong adjustment in our plant and causing ourselves a ton of headaches. Today, we are discussing the pH scale, which is the measurement of how acidic or basic something is, as well as alkalinity, which is something's ability to resist change in pH, its buffering capacity. After we discuss these things on the whiteboard, I'm going to take you on an experiment where I will visually demonstrate to you how something can be basic, but not alkaline. Lastly, I'm going to take you through three places in the wastewater treatment plant where pH and alkalinity play a critical role anaerobic digestion, the chlorine contact chamber, and aeration. Welcome to the Wastewater Enthusiast YouTube channel, everybody. If you haven't already subscribed, please do so, so you can get notified of future videos. And if you get anything out of this, throw me a like, let me know that you appreciate this kind of content. And with that, let's head to the whiteboard and start with the pH scale. Okay, here we have the pH scale. It's a zero to 14 scale, zero being the strongest acid, 14 being the strongest base, and the seven being neutral, right in the middle. But what does that even mean? I mean, how do you even measure something like that? Let me explain. We're gonna come back to this picture in a second. pH is the measure of hydrogen ion concentration. It's been written power of hydrogen, potential of hydrogen is another way, potential. If you look at the P, potential or power of hydrogen, okay? An acid is gonna have more hydrogen ion concentration and a base is gonna have more hydroxide ion concentration relative to the hydrogen ion concentration. Let me explain further, okay? So let's go back to here and talk about what a neutral pH means. If I was to put my electrode in the water that measures pH, I would get a zero millivolt read right at a perfect seven because the positively charged hydrogen ion is in equilibrium, perfect equilibrium with the negatively charged hydroxide ion, okay? The stronger the hydrogen ion concentration becomes, the more positively charged the water becomes, my electrode will pull up a more positive millivolt charge and give me a corresponding number. The higher that millivolt charge, the lower the number on the scale. Conversely, the more negative the charge in millivolts that that detects, the higher the number on the pH scale I get because I have more hydroxide ion concentration. So you may ask me, Sean, Wait a second, if we're measuring the power of hydrogen, why is it that the more hydrogen we have, the lower number we get? That's because this is what's called an inverse scale. And I cannot tell you why it's inverted, it just is, and know that it is. That you have a higher concentration of hydrogen, the lower the number will be. So let me ask you a quick test question. If I have a pH of 7.2, you see neutral is seven, is that basic, acidic, or neutral? if you said neutral, which is what most people want to say right here, that would be wrong. 7.2 is basic, slightly basic, but it's still basic. Why do I say that? Because this is a logarithmic scale, meaning there is a tenfold increase on each unit. Okay. And you see these numbers I'm writing, a pH of six is 10 times more acidic than a seven. A five is a hundred times more acidic than a seven, and a four is a thousand times more acidic than seven, and so on and so on, all the way to zero. Conversely, at the eight, we are 10 times more basic than seven, a nine is a hundred times more basic than not, um, seven, and 10 is a thousand times more basic than seven, okay? And using that logic, if four is a thousand times more acidic than seven, then it's 10,000 times more acidic than eight, a hundred thousand times more acidic than nine, and a million times more acidic than 10, okay? So when we're talking about a logarithmic scale, if I'm asked, is a drinking water that has a pH of 7.3 neutral or basic, it's actually two times more basic than seven. And a 7.5 is over three times more basic than seven. So if you're asked this question, is a 7.2 basic or neutral, it's basic on an exam. Now, we would say it's very close to neutral. It's a very, very weak base. But at the core of the definition, what they're looking for is to make sure you understand that it would be considered slightly basic, okay? And if, if you have a 6.8, that would be slightly acidic, right? And if you come down here to water, you see water is a seven, they say that. I rarely peg seven right on the nose. My uh, drinking water is typically around a 7.4 and my wastewater varies. My effluent varies anywhere between 
a six, I'm write it over here, a 6.9 and a 7.3. It bounces around, okay? So now that we kind of understand what acid and base even are, the measurement of the hydrogen ion concentration relative to the hydroxide ion concentration, what's alkalinity? That gets me to that statement I made at the very beginning. Alkaline and base are not the same thing. All alkaline substances are basic, but not all basic substances are alkaline for the sake of our context. And what context is that? Drinking and wastewater treatment in an aqueous solution. You can have something that's very basic, but has no buffering capacity and its pH will change really fast. So introduce alkalinity, which is the measure of buffering capacity against pH changes. This can also be said how much capacity it has to resist change in pH to a, to a um, 4.5. At a 4.5, no alkalinity is left in a substance, and it'll take an absolute nosedive if you, even the smallest amount of acid is added. Okay, And also another thing uh, alkalinity is known for is its ability to neutralize acid. There's three different definitions in essence. Okay, Neutralize acid. So alkalinity's ability to neutralize acid. Some key points here is that alkalinity equals buffering capacity. It comes mostly from bicarbonates, carbonates, and hydroxides. And you say, wait a second, if the base is the measurement of hydroxide ion concentration, wouldn't that mean that alkaline and basic are the same thing? Note only under special circumstances when hydroxide ions contribute to alkalinity is when the substance is typically greater than 10 pH, okay? then it can give some buffering capacity. But for the sake of what we're talking about, bicarbonates and carbonates are going to be your biggest and most reliable source of alkalinity. And it's measured in milligrams per liter as calcium carbonate equivalent. You can also have some like forms of magnesium in here. And I don't want to get too far in the weeds because when you're asked on an exam, what is the form of alkalinity that is used in a digester, for instance, what they're looking for is bicarbonates. They're not looking for hydroxides, even though it can be used, they're looking for bicarbonate, okay? I'm getting nuanced here, but it's an important distinction. So how is this relevant to you? Think of alkalinity as your plant's shock absorber for pH changes, okay? If you've got a high, you've got a high pH and you've got a bunch of acid shock load coming through from an industrial dump and you don't have buffering capacity, your pH will drop like a rock. If alkalinity drops too low, even small, sorry about that, it drops too low, even small acid inputs can crash pH, okay? Let me now take you to a demonstration. I said earlier in the video we we're gonna do an experiment. It's actually more of a metaphor, but I'm going to show you with a visual demonstration what I mean on how two things can be a high pH and how one will hold its pH better than the other when an acid is introduced. So now let's go and demonstrate what I'm talking about. Okay, so I ran a little experiment. I was gonna do it for the camera, but it just wasn't showing up really well with my infrared gun. So I'll explain what I did, and so you'll understand. If you've ever worked with aluminum foil, you're gonna understand the metaphor without having me having to show it to you. So I put a thick galvanized steel coupler and this piece of aluminum foil into my toaster oven here. And I warmed them both up to 200 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? I pulled the aluminum foil out and watched it almost immediately. It was a few seconds drop down to ambient temperature, 70 degrees, okay? This, I'm wearing gloves because it's still hot. This was several minutes ago. And what we're representing here, the temperature would be the representation of a change in pH. Um, and the foil is a change in pH without a buffer. So this is me just fixing my pH and not even thinking about my alkalinity. And this would be my pH adjustment and alkalinity adjustment in the face of an acid, the ambient temperature being our acid, okay? This is resisting the change in temperature. This had no resistance to the change in temperature. And so you'll run into this in the plant, you know? You need to make a pH adjustment because your pH is low. You also need to look at that alkalinity because you could adjust the pH, wonderful. You can come back two hours later and it's dropped right back down because you don't have buffer capacity in the form of bicarbonate, all right? So if you have any questions about that, plop it in the comments below. But right now, we're going to now go to three locations in the plant and talk about how pH and alkalinity work together in these three processes. And the first stop is the anaerobic digester. If you want a really interesting example of the tug of war between pH and alkalinity in a wastewater plant, look no further than the anaerobic digester. Now, this old soul, we did a video on months ago. I'll put it in the description below if you've not seen it. 
we go into all of this. I'm not gonna talk about it now. What I'm gonna talk about is that tight parameter we run in the tank. Ideally, you're gonna wanna see a pH between a seven and a 7.2, okay? Textbook answer is 6.8 to 7.2, but honestly, 6.8 is a little on the acidic side for my comfort zone. I would be really, really focused on my alkalinity at that point and, and watching it like a hawk. And that's just it. I shouldn't be actually looking at my pH for any sort of real indicator. I should be watching my alkalinity, more specifically, my acid to alkalinity ratio, which should be less than 0.1, okay? So ideally, I'm gonna have 2,500 to 3,500 milligrams per liter alkalinity in the form of bicarbonate or calcium carbonate equivalent. And over here on my acid side, I'm gonna be running somewhere between a 250 and 350 milligram per liter as acetic acid. They're gonna be, you know, less than 0.1. It should have 10 times more alkalinity. And you would think if alkaline and base were the same thing, and I know I'm belaboring the point, that if I was running that level of alkalinity, wouldn't it stand to reason my pH would be more than a seven or a 7.2? It should be much higher than that, right? So that's just it. This is a buffer, it's a shock absorber. And so let's just talk about real quick what's going on inside this tank. When I feed fresh sludge to a digester, food for the microbes, the first microbes that get to work are the acid formers, okay? They work very fast. They work way faster than the methane formers. They create this acid and the methane formers consume that acid, all right? And then they create biogas for us. The problem is if I overfeed the digester or I pull too much finished sludge off too fast and my sludge retention time is way low, the acid formers move a lot faster than the methane formers and they create too much acid and it overwhelms that buffer capacity and you'll start seeing the pH drop significantly. And then your digester will go sour, it will get stuck, your biogas suffers and eventually it'll just stop doing anything. It won't, it'll be so bad that you're gonna have to really intervene with chemical addition, okay? So this is one example in the plant of where you have to really watch that balance between pH and alkalinity and make sure that tug of war is within equilibrium. Okay, if you have any questions about that, put it in the comments below. If you are an expert on anaerobic digestion, you have anything to add that would help people, put it in the comments below. Now let's head to aeration and take a look at another example of that tug of war. This is my aeration basin for my membrane bioreactor. I do nitrify in here. What does that mean? Nitrification is the biological oxidation of ammonia to nitrite, nitrite to nitrate. In this process, acids are formed, okay? There's an acid byproduct. I need something to buffer against those acids and consume them. So if I do not, what's gonna happen? pH is gonna plummet. And you may say, who cares? Let your pH go down. The biology cares, because these microbes will shut down. They will stop doing their job, they'll stop uptaking oxygen, and they'll, in essence, go dormant or die. And that's not a good thing. I've actually witnessed it. It's a very unhappy day when that happens, okay? So what do we do? We run a certain alkalinity in here in a bicarbonate form. If it's all about the equilibrium between hydrogen and hydroxide, why don't you run it at a nine or a 10? Because that's also toxic to the biology. I need something in here that will consume the acid without spiking the pH, and that is alkalinity. Now, what's really interesting is on the denitrification side of things in that tank over there, when the biology reduces nitrate to nitrogen gas through the re biological reduction process, it actually puts more alkalinity back in the water. Okay, it returns some of that alkalinity. It's really fascinating science, and I highly recommend you check it out. I actually did a whole whiteboard on nitrification and denitrification. I'll put that down in the links below as well. So let's go to one more place in the plant that pH and alkalinity play a crucial role. So behind me, I have my bulk storage for sodium hypochlorite. This is a liquid form of chlorine. Like its counterpart calcium hypochlorite, which it's a dry powdered solid form of chlorine, it raises the pH when it's added to the water. It is a base. Now, chlorine gas on the other hand is acidic. When it is added to the water, it lowers the pH. Okay, and you may ask me, why does this matter? Because when any of these forms of chlorine are added to the water, they dissociate into two forms, hypochlorous acid and the hypochlorite ion. Can you guess which one's more powerful? If you guessed hypochlorous acid, you would be correct. And there's an equilibrium between those two based on where you fall on the pH scale. The lower on the scale you go, the more hypochlorous acid you have. The higher on the pH scale you go, the more hypochlorite ion you have, okay? So when I add chlorine gas and my pH drops, I actually need less chlorine because I have more effective disinfection power in hypochlorous acid. That's why when you're doing your CT calculations, they ask you what your pH is. Temperature also plays a huge role in it. We're gonna talk about that later when I do my disinfection video. Now, on the hypochlorite ion side, I would actually have to run a stronger concentration to get the same disinfection power as the lower pH, okay? Because I'm at a higher pH. 
Again, we'll talk about that more in great detail in my disinfection video. Okay, so where does alkalinity fit into all this? Well, take chlorine gas, for instance. Say I need to increase my dose. I've got coliform issues and I need to bump up from a, I don't know, two part per million to a four part per million. Well, if I were to do that, all things being equal, I would be lowering the pH even more. The alkalinity allows me to actually increase that dose of this acid-based disinfectant without sacrificing my pH. It'll absorb that shock and we can have a gentle drift down lower rather than fall off a cliff, okay? Also, you can kind of see it in the picture frame right now. I've got my bisulfite over here, my sodium bisulfite, which is a liquid dechlorination chemical, all right? I add that right before my water goes out to the ocean. So, say my chemical pump went cattywampus on me, okay? It just started feeding overdosing for some reason. When I'm monitoring my effluent total chlorine residual, I'm still gonna get a zero, but what I could also see is my pH is starting to drop in a steady way, but not fall off a cliff, okay? That alkalinity is absorbing the shock of that overdose of an acid, and it allows me to react before I violate my permit, you know, and drop under a 6.5. All right, I hope this helped you understand a little bit more about the difference between pH and alkalinity and how they relate and how they differ. If you have any questions about what you saw in the video today, please put it in the comments below. If you're an expert and you think I missed something or didn't explain it as well as I could have, also please put it in the comments below and help people out. And until next time, have a great day, everybody. We'll catch you in the next one.